Um, you know, starting with the starting with blockchain, I should say, and uh, slowly expanding into robotics and uh, you know, 3D printing and AI and uh, all of that good stuff. So really looking to pioneer the field of the economics of emerging tech. So which exists maybe in a disintegrated fashion, but not not itself. And and I think this this room here and this audience here is 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 the right ground um, to discuss this. Um, and I was thinking about, you know, the circles that I've been in, the conversation has been, and, and Jamie, you can probably testify to that, the conversation is, the world is broken, and emerging tech is going to save us. Right. <laughs> right. That is the conversation. Like, so, you know, the problems with governance, with injustice, and equality, all that is all that is wrong with the world will be fixed by blockchain and AI. Right. And, and, and I thought to myself, well, okay, all that is good, but really, what is it that's holding us back? And I'll try to answer that question towards the end of this. Um, so, so that is the context, and uh, comes down to, well, what the, you know, adoption of the technology looks like. And, I want to talk a little bit more about what I call the New World Economic Order. And I did not invent it. It's not a conspiracy theory. Uh, all that we're discussing has has been has been discussed before, um, with slightly less uh, history, of course. And and I think Gary, you can you can add more color to it. Um, 1974, uh, United Nations General Assembly talked about the establishment of the new international economic order, which was at that time triggered by the north-south divide and the dialogue. So countries from the south, like India and China and others are saying, well, this is neo-colonialism, capitalists flowing from the periphery to the core. And so this declaration, um, was adopted, but none of the actionable items were acted upon. So, so keep that in mind, right? Um, and of course, you know about the SDGs. This is for an audience where I would bring it at that point and why we need to care about the sustainable development goals. Ever since my personal journey has shifted from just sustainability to regenerative systems, which again is not new, at least eight to 10 years of literature, and I was talking to uh, uh, Powell yesterday, last night about it, so I'm, I'm extremely happy he included that in this presentation, particularly my experience in, in Costa Rica uh, from, from last month. So very quickly, um, focusing purpose, attracting capital, driving growth, and adjusting risk, those are the four big buckets under what we've talked about roughly falls. So this is an attempt to synthesize that. But what we have not talked about so much so far, and we've touched upon it or briefly um, mentioned, is the fact that the consumer of the future is is changing. And what are those changes? We, we have talk, I've made a point about the way they're consuming media. We talked about <coughs> investing in human capital. Um, but they're also demanding um, the fact that portfolios uh, invest in sustainable companies, right? And I want to share some data points here, uh, just so it's clear who's at the forefront of it. So currently, it's millennials. You know, 87% of them, uh, the the biggest wealth holders, 37% uh, of all of all the high net worth in, uh, investors are renew, you know reviewing their portfolios for impact investments. Uh, something that Mark mentioned as well. Um, and so then the question really is, can technology help achieve the global goals? And the answer lies in fulfilling some conditions that need to hold true simultaneously. And those are decentralization, scale, security, and speed. Ever since I've updated to add privacy to it, since GDPR um, and all the work we do at MIT Media Lab around um, <coughs> around privacy, um, but if you think about it, the technology that powers the current system that we are stuck in, if you may, is a certain type of technology that you know. You can argue technology is neutral, but is it really? It is not. No. no. 
that's an open-ended question, or, or, or maybe not, right? <laughs> so if you design a system such that you can only connect to another party if you go through a certain party, then how is technology neutral? It defines behavior. Right, and, and so, uh, but yet at the same time, we have to ensure that the technology that is not up to the mark to fulfill the needs that we currently have um, is, is, is not the contestant, this is not the right contestant. For example, blockchain systems are not yet ready for the sort of scale we are looking for, right? The scale of the number of transactions or payments that, that get processed by. Visa is a typical example that's given uh, something like 50,000 transactions per second. So all of these things need to hold true at the same time, right? Security, because the more we rely on digital technological systems, the higher the risks the more fragile the system, the more cascading the impacts. Um, so we need speed, but we also need decentralization exactly to reduce security risk so that a single node in the network does not hold the key to everything such that you cannot attack a single node and take down the entire system. So I quickly wanted to talk about, but I think I'm just going to go through these and just show you what's on the slide, then, then discuss it really. Um, there are three technologies that I've added here um, on blockchain as the feature infrastructure technology uh, that can raise trillions of dollars needed to, to finance the SDGs. We discussed that. Um, and again, this presentation is a synthesis of what we've talked to with a, an emphasis <coughs> on technology. Um, and bring a systemic sh uh, shift, something that Mina mentioned before, from the shareholder to the stakeholder, right? And incentivize behavioral change, which I think is the most important thing, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, or machine learning, you know, they say, uh, at the Media Lab, they say, if, if you don't know anything, then you call it AI. If, uh, if you do, then it's machine learning. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, never use the word AI. Um, so again, with, with the intelligent machines, you have tools that can automate processes. So that means shift in our label, uh, labor force functions, right? I was recently coding from Tyler Cohen's Average is Over. He's a, a labor economist. He talks about how the US economy is really getting divided into these two economies that I think Powell talked about too. One is the, the high tech uh, capitalist people who are able to deploy intelligent machines and are building the systems and the platforms. That will be used by everybody else. So the, the, the jobs in the middle are eroding away. All the jobs that got added, and this is even before the recession, it's not a consequence of the recession, it's happening well before, we know that empirically uh, to be true, are just low paying jobs. So, and we have position that, that we can achieve that wasn't possible before. Quick example, at, the, at MIT, for every dollar that they raise, there is 70 cents of overhead. I mean, think about it. 70 cents, this is almost 100%, right? And so where is this money going? There's inefficient systems, people who are basically their function is to just move information around. So there's a lot of moral and, and you know uh, panic around AI replacing jobs, it's true, but the thing is economists are obsessed with efficiency. Uh, and I, I think it's gonna happen. So the best way we can, what we can do is to, um, to again, like the previous panel talked about, to actually um, train our workforces to do work or develop skills that are not replaceable. And these are essentially creative jobs, things that require creativity and they require empathy. Um, mitigating systemic failures that could be possible um, or not. Uh, and then unleashing imagination, something that I'm excited about the most. For example, painting in 3D, painting with all the, all, all the new tools, and it's, it's, it's super interesting. Now we talked about um, global supply chains, we talked about the carbon footprint of the fact that things move around. But think about this, 3D printing on the other hand can just throw the whole thing out of the window because it's no longer um, manufacturing that requires bits and pieces and inputs from all over the world. Uh, you can just produce it in, in your lab. Maybe you will be printing your clothes 10 years from now, right, in your own home. So um, 
what I'm really saying is while we need to change behaviors and we need to change habits, it's possible that technology can transform the way our complex adaptive network itself looks like. So the markets that existed before may not exist in the future, or new markets may open, just like Uber did, by reducing search and, uh, search and uh, transaction costs so low that everybody can afford a private driver now and in, in five minutes. Um, so leading to decentralized local production, um, you know, removing the problem altogether of um, how production is happening around the world, and democratizing fast production, and customizing uh, such that no one size fits all, and then reducing waste, of course, which is very important. And again, unleashing a new era of creativity. While we added, um, earlier this year, um, my collaborator Forbes, Lawrence uh, Wintermere, and I wrote this article about well, the next big trend in tech is humanity. Um, and so the question really is, um, what's stopping us? And I think it really is adoption. And by that, um, I mean actual real life adoption. So interestingly enough, we talk about small industries, small companies disrupting big ones, um, at least in tech space, that is the, the narrative. But if you really look at the data, um, let me jump here first. It's the big enterprises that are leading the future of tech, because they are the ones that have the resources uh, to actually experiment with them. So that, that reinforces our point that we need to hold big corporates responsible. Uh, if you look at the left hand side, this is uh, the medium sized industries, something between 100 to 500 people, and on the right hand side are organizations with 5,000 or more people. So if you look at all the digital trends, IT, uh, IoT, uh, hyper-converged infrastructure, 3D printing, blockchain, uh, it's folks on the right-hand side that are, that are playing with it. And the good news about adoption is that it's been accelerating in, in tech. This is what that chart shows. Starting over the past one century, you can see how older technologies like refrigerators and radios and microwaves took so much longer to, to reach saturation. But if you look at ebook reader, tablet, if you look at their historical um, adoption, that is accelerating. So the good news is that even though emerging tech is not adopted yet, it could be adopted at a very fast scale, uh, particularly because the internet exists already and to piggyback on, which wasn't present before. So this is my last slide, and I'm gonna invite Gary over um, to the front end. So what are the challenges to, to user adoption, right? Um, just to leave you with that, first and the foremost, behavioral change, and whether we are questioning our assumptions or not in traditional disciplines, I think it is happening already. You know, the field of behavioral economics, the field of behavioral theory, intersections, the call for integrated social sciences. Um, the American Economic Association, I previously mentioned, is convening in January. Now it is the Allied Social Sciences Alliance, ASSA. So uh, we are moving towards a world where social sciences are integrated together. So the artificial dichotomy of where this versus that, the classification and the silos we got stuck in are, are getting removed. And there's more and more scope for people who are good with tech, with intelligent machines, uh, to find employment in, in, in those spheres. Um, and again, I talked about industry standards before, which is a hindrance to interoperability, different systems that could talk to each other. And finally, governance, which is the most important thing. And it's, it's not a coincidence that, you know, I'm talking about this at the World Bank. It's all planned. Uh, <laughs> But that's really what uh, it comes down to, right? And, and we absolutely need to agree. So in, in many ways, this, this reinforces um, all that we talked about in the, in the past two days. And I'll leave you with this. I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. James Baldwin has been one of my um, heroes since I was a teenager, um, the most influential black author, I guess, in history. And uh, that should be our attitude, I think. Ready. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um,
Leave you with Rethink Market, the economics think tank. This is not a marketing pitch, so I <laughs> almost forgot about it. Think tank that uh, I'm building at the moment. So this is a loose structure where we can have these conversations and collaborate, and um, uh, you know, along with with Voss. And it, this is uh, focused in the scope on the economics of emerging tech. So please come talk, and uh, whatever way I could help. Yeah.